Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the, uh, the closing session. That's the way most of us feel. But I won't even ask Pat Montier what she thinks. I think happy. Okay, folks, uh, thanks very much for, uh, for uh, well, as they say in Hawaii, for hanging loose, right? And hanging out with us uh, through the sessions and uh, through the last uh, three days. You've, um, you're going to have a very interesting presentation this afternoon. Let's uh, start out by uh, just a, uh, a couple of remarks from me. Uh, again, thank you all very much for your attendance, your interest in not only this uh, day's, this uh, conference's activities per se, but in the interaction with one another. Uh, if we don't communicate, if we don't network, then we're not going to get where we're wanting to go, which is uh, up and out, right? Right? Right! The, uh, the final few words uh, here I want to give to uh, to Lloyd Case, president of CSDC and uh, our host at this uh, conference. So, uh, Lloyd.
years ago, um, partly, almost six now, partly out of a little frustration at the time with the way things were going internally, partly as uh, a result of California chapters wanting to network together and do some things on a little larger scale than we were able to do. And I think that a lot of the efforts that we've done have been invisible. We focused sort of inward for a long time. We have worked with NSS to sort of develop better relationships that, with them. But we've also focused on our internal organizations. We've gone through some growing pains. We've made some mistakes. But I think that uh, starting about a year ago, I detected something that I would call a renewal of purpose. And uh, in fact, it's, it's interesting to me that the one guy who sort of leads us all and sort of his, his attitude and visionary actually kind of trailed us in this. So Terry Savage <coughs> kind of went through this big crisis of, uh, of doubt for a little while, but I detected in him at this conference a real renewal of purpose. And I'm starting to detect among other chapters and chapter members a renewal of purpose. Just in the last couple of days, it's been really exciting to me to see that. Uh, people actually wanting to work at a very local level and, and start to grow and do some things there. Uh, I think CSDC uh, is a model in some respects for regional organization, if only because we know what the mistakes are. And so uh, if, if anybody in here is starting to be interested in, in uh, forming regional organizations, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you because we can certainly tell you where you screw up before you do it. Um, <laughs> But hopefully we can give you some insights on time home and success. Um, but I really think that uh, it's sort of that spreading out the lower level. You know, national headquarters is very good at key things that they do. They're very good at working with Congress. They're very good at lobbying, uh, particularly with some of the sister organization structure that they've developed. And I think they've been successful in that area, and I think they'll continue to be successful. I think our jobs, in addition to supporting those initiatives when those come up, is also to talk to the people around you, your neighbor with your friends, and the people at work, and just, you know, little by little, make it seem like it's a mainstream idea. Now, for all of us who like to lead the way, kind of making things seem, space seem like a mainstream idea can be both gratifying and at the same time unsettling. Sometimes it's fun to be part of a fringe element because you can say, hey, I'm not going to try. But uh, I think that if it's really going to be successful and if we're really going to get out there, it's going to have to be a mainstream idea. If you look at the growth of the environmental movement, uh, however some of you may think of the philosophies there, they did it because just little by little, they made it a mainstream idea. And you look at it now, and it's just another piece of the political spectrum. So I think we really need to, to have that happen. Uh, one other thing that uh, I'd like to comment on is sort of another philosophy that HP has, but this one isn't written down. Uh, I'll tell this in the story. There's a marketing manager at one of our divisions, a guy named Chuck House, who uh, was at one time a product manager for a product that any of you in the computer business know, knows as a logic analyzer. <laughs> well, th th at that time, back in the early 70s, this particular division was making oscilloscopes. And Chuck, who was the marketing guy and some of the R&D guys, came up with this new idea for an oscilloscope that was basically going to track how computers work. Well, they built prototypes, and we were getting ready to sell it. Bill Hewlett, who was co-founder of Hewlett Packard, of course, and one of the, at that time, uh, one of the principal stockholders came in and looked at this and said, no, we don't want to do this product, kill it. So Chuck House went off and scratched his head for a while and basically uh, uh, found some money to kind of keep it alive. And Bill Hewlett found out that they managed to keep it alive and appeared on the cover of Electronics Magazine as a product of the year. <laughs> So there's sort of this underlying philosophy that uh, skunk works are going to happen no matter what. And I see the chapters as being the skunk works of the society. Um, and I think we should continue that. Um, one other thought I would like to talk about is people in general. I think one of the things that's truly important if we want to make this um, popular in the mainstream is you've got to learn to communicate well with people. Uh, it's very easy to talk to each other about this stuff. We understand the technical jargon. We've been around it for a long time. Even those people who don't have technical degrees get up after a while. So you pick up this polyglot jargon that's a combination of a lot of different engineering disciplines, maybe some political language in there, and you talk to somebody out there, and they kind of get gla this glazed look over their face. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen many times. And it just doesn't happen. So you have to communicate on people's terms, other people's terms. That's very difficult. Um, putting yourself in the other person's shoes is not an easy thing. 
And I would urge everybody in this room to do whatever it takes to kind of put yourself in that frame of mind. It may be just thinking about it and doing it. It may be taking speech classes. It may be doing whatever it takes. But learn how to communicate with people on, a, on their level, not at yours, because it's going to take them a while. You may recall, as you were coming up, uh, you probably didn't understand what the hell was going on either. Uh, and I'll close my comments, uh, first of all, by thanking everybody for coming here. We've had a great time hosting you. Uh, I think Pat's relieved. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I think Charles Miller has put on a hell of a program. Also, and she had this great story that I want to use because I think it's very uh, pertinent, particularly to the growth of chapters. Uh, Chinese farmers, uh, there, are, there are folks in China that raise bamboo. As you know, in the Far East, bamboo is a critical crop. They use it for construction, they use it for building roadways, they use it for a variety of purposes. Bamboo, as it turns out, is not an easy crop to grow. The way it works is a Chinese farmer goes out there every day and he waters this little plant. Goes out there every day and takes care of it, he fertilizes it. Four years, he does this. It's this little plant, nothing happened. Now, you gotta admire sort of the, the Chinese psychology there, because an American person, after watering this thing for three weeks, they say, forget it, <laughs> plant something else. Um, after four years, that little bamboo plant grows 90 feet in 60 days. So think about that when you're struggling with chapters and trying to recruit members and all that stuff. Remember the Chinese farmer. It takes a while, but when it starts to take off, it takes off fast. Thanks a lot.
that I'm going to talk about, that I was intending to talk about, is the colonization of Mars. Um, but the colonization of Mars has got to be seen as part of basically, or the moon for that matter, three phases, the way I see it, is that you have an exploration phase, a base building phase, and finally a true large scale colonization phase. Uh, and it's clear that you don't get to the third unless you can get through the first two. And um, we've heard a lot at this conference about really the critical juncture that phase one, that is the initiation of the true colon uh, exploration of Mars and the thorough exploration in the beginning of base building on the moon is represented by SEI, the critical phase that's, that, that's in, and somewhat grim predicament because of the opposition in Congress and the appearance that has been generated that SEI is a somewhat unattractive program looking like $400 billion over 40 years and we don't even get to Mars until uh, the people who are now in, in, in grade school are ready to retire. Um, and uh, so that, well, at Martin Marietta, we have a, what we call a scenario development team. I'm on it. And we've developed a mission architecture for doing SEI that we believe is much more cost effective than the sorts of things that you've seen up till now. Um, and the particular architecture that I'm going to show you at the beginning of this, and then move from there through a base building phase on Mars to a discussion of the question of colonizing Mars in a very large way. Uh, this mission architecture was worked out by me in collaboration with David Baker, a co-worker of mine over there. We call it Mars Direct. It's a little bit misnamed because we're also able to do the moon with the same hardware, about 80% commonality. And the missions, what you're, what you're about to see, is extremely technologically conservative. We have designed it in order to create a mission architecture which we believe uh, can be potentially acceptable to NASA with its imperatives for safety and reliability and assuredness that the thing will really work. Uh, and not that it would merely be great if it did work, but it won't. Um, okay. And our philosophy on this is to get the SEI going, get both the Moon and Mars going now, at the same time that more advanced technologies are aggressively pursued and then those are introduced into the scenario when they become available. But we don't hold the mission hostage to them, but on the other hand, we don't freeze the technology and stay forever at the current state of the art. So I'm going to introduce to you the uh, architecture known as Mars Direct. This is the first fully open presentation of this architecture anywhere. Um, and uh, we'll start, I'm going to concentrate on the Mars side of it and I will briefly discuss how it can be used for the moon. I think the people here are capable of, of putting together the missing blanks on that, but I want to keep the focus on Mars, and you'll see how we can do the whole SEI uh, in it, and then move on from there. First slide. This is the basic mission plan to the Mars Direct Architecture. What you have is a launch vehicle, which is a shuttle-derived launch vehicle with a substantial hydrogen oxygen upper stage. That is what that launch vehicle consists of is two SRVs off the shelf, an external tank, except without the ogive, which is the pointy thing on top of the ET today, just get rid of that. And four main engines, not three, it's gotta be four. You'll there are reasons for that. Uh, in a pod at the bottom. And then on top of the external tank a hydrogen oxygen upper stage with about 250,000 pounds of thrust, which is about half the thrust of an SSME, is about equal to that of the J2 engine that was used during Apollo. Now, this booster can lift 120 tons, metric tons to LEO, but that's not what it's designed to do. It could do that, and if you want a space station, it can launch it for you in an afternoon. But this thing is designed to send payloads to the moon and Mars, direct, lift, and throw. Keep it simple, the same way we would do a space mission today. This can throw 40 metric tons onto a minimum energy trans-Mars injection trajectory, a little more than that actually, and about 50 metric tons onto trans-lunar injection. Well, what do we do? At an early launch opportunity, which is really December 96, we call it 97, uh, to work even numbers here, 
we lift and throw onto a trajectory to Mars a 40 metric ton payload. There's no one in it. It's unmanned. What this payload consists of is the following. The object that you see up there on the first line. It is a two-stage methane oxygen driven Mars ascent and Earth return vehicle unfueled. There's no methane oxygen in it. If it was, it would weigh a lot more than it does. It's got an aero brake and a small amount of hydrogen oxygen and hydrogen oxygen engines to land it on Mars with the aid of a parachute. That's a very small delta V. And it has, within the tanks that are later going to hold the methane and oxygen, six tons of liquid hydrogen cargo. And it has a 100 kilowatt, which is a rather small, nuclear reactor, 100 kilowatt electric, mounted in the back of a methane oxygen driven light truck. The reactor doesn't drive the truck, it's just a conventional truck with an oxygen tank. So it can work on Mars. Um, okay, this thing gets to Mars. An arrow captures into orbit at Mars, and then it enters and it lands with the aid of a chute. Now you're on the ground. What do you do? You telerobotically drive the truck slowly because there's a time lag in transmission signals from Mars to Earth. You take your time. You drive the truck a couple of hundred yards away from the landing site. And with the help of a winch, you lower the reactor off of the truck into a depression in the terrain, either a natural one or one that you create with a couple of sticks of dynamite. Okay. Then the radiators of the reactor are deployed. A cable has been run back to the ship during this whole process. We're unwinding cable off of the windlass as we drive along and we have power. The reactor has not been used until this point. The reactor has been clean until it is on the ground on Mars. Now, we've got 100 kilowatts of the landing site. What do we do with it? We use it to run a pump. And what we do is we acquire Martian atmosphere, which is 95% carbon dioxide, and which can be easily acquired as a simple physical acquisition process. It can be liquefied through simple compression and then distilled through evaporation in an extremely simple process. We react the carbon dioxide catalytically with the hydrogen to produce methane and water. That is an exothermic reaction. You are running downhill on the chemical slope. And what that means is you can do it fast. The rate that, that governs how you can do that reaction is governed only by two things. One, the rate at which you can acquire raw CO2, which is fast because it's a simple pump process. And the second is the rate at which you can dissipate the heat generated by the reaction, which is also fast because you're not trying to convert it to electricity. You can just use high temperature radiators and, and throw it away. Okay. And what it means is that with 100 kilowatts working for you, you can turn all of your six tons of liquid hydrogen into methane and water in 25 hours. Okay. If you have half capacity, do it in two days. Doesn't matter. Two days, three days doesn't make any difference. You can do it fast. There is no problem with long-term storage of cryogenic hydrogen on the surface of Mars. You are rapidly fixing the hydrogen into a non-cryogenic form. Now what do you do? You liquefy the methane as it is produced, and then when you're all done with fixing the hydrogen, you begin a much longer and more tedious process, because it's endothermic, of electrolysizing the water. As the, hy as the hydrogen is produced, it is run back through the methanation reaction, as the oxygen is produced, it is liquefied and stored as liquid oxygen. Okay. Ultimately, that process produces about 24 tons of methane and about 46 tons, uh, 48 tons of liquid oxygen. Uh, so you've already levered six tons into 72, but we will actually generate more oxygen through direct reduction of Mars atmospheric CO2 into carbon monoxide and oxygen, and store the oxygen and throw away the monoxide and ultimately, we are going to produce, for our desired mixture ratio that we're going to run our engines at, 107 tons of methane oxygen. The leverage that is done here is 18 to 1. Six tons of hydrogen delivered produces 107 tons of methane oxygen on Mars. And every one of the reactions that we're proposing to use here has been in widespread commercial use for 100 years on Earth. The, okay, so now how long does it take to do those two other reactions? which you can take a long time on because you don't have a cryogen to work with. If you had the full 100 kilowatts from the reactor, it would take five months. But let's say we have half capacity. 
to be conservative. Ten months. Well, it took eight months for that ship to fly to Mars. It took ten months to make the propellant. That's 18 months. Okay? There are 26 months between launch opportunities from Earth to Mars. Only 18 have gone by. That means you've got enough time, plenty of time, to evaluate whether the propellant production operation has been successfully completed, and if it has, in 1999, at the next mission opportunity, you launch two more boosters. One sends another Earth return vehicle slash fuel factory. The other sends a manned spacecraft, which is a HAB, and that is a simple disk HAB, 27 feet in diameter, with two decks, 600 square feet of floor space per deck. You get artificial gravity on the way out to Mars simply by tethering off the burnt out upper stage and rotating at one RPM with a 1500 meter tether. It's a very low risk first application of tethers in space because if something goes wrong, you just clip the tether and all you've lost is artificial G. The element is no longer mission critical. Anyway, when you do get to Mars, and actually the manned vehicle is leading the unmanned one out by perhaps a week or two, it arrow captures into orbit. Well, shortly before it arrow captures, it dumps the tether, throws away the, the stage. Then it arrow captures into orbit, and then it goes and it lands at landing site number one, where there is a fully fueled Earth return vehicle waiting for it. Now, we've been on the ground at site number one for two years. We've had a few local science rovers running around taking pictures. We found the absolute best landing field in that vicinity. We've laid out navigation beacons. Uh, radar beacons right on the ground. X marks the spot. We've got a human pilot on board. The thing coming in, we should be able to land right there. Okay. Now, if, however, there is an error, a massive error, and we land 30 miles away, and even Viking, both Vikings landing, flying totally blind without any navigation errors or any control once they entered, were able to land within 30 miles. It's not a problem, because that half has with it a pressurized ground rover, which uses methane oxygen engines, we do everything on the ground with methane oxygen, uh, to, which has a one-way theoretical range, assuming no chasms block it or something like that, but a one-way capability maximum of 600 miles. It is almost inconceivable you cannot land within the range of that pressurized ground rover. But, if you do, if things go wrong, there is a third level of backup in the scenario which is simply that you have another Earth return vehicle fuel factory following you out. And if you do land 3,000 miles away by accident, you redirect the second one to land by you, and then you make propellant there. Now, in that case, you're counting on the fuel factory to operate in the present tense as opposed to the past tense, but this is a third level backup. Okay? And finally, the fourth level of backup is the fact that all the supplies for the mission are in the ham, three-year mission, they can actually tough it out on the ground, on Mars, until a relief mission could be launched at the next launch opportunity. So there's a four-layer defense in depth on the mission. It's extremely conservative. Now, let's say, however, you do land, land correctly at site number one. Then what you do is you take the second uh, ERB fuel factory and you land it at a new site, which could be anywhere. But let's say, for example, you choose a distance 500 miles away. I like that because that is the long distance away, but within the one-way driving range of your ground transportation. It starts then making methane ox, which it will use to support the next manned expedition, which flies out in 2001, along with another ERV to open up site number three. And so it goes. So each two years, you launch two boosters. That is an average rate of launch of one per year to support a virtually continuous presence of humanity on Mars. That, that can be easily integrated into the existing you know, launch schedules or whatever. You can clearly do it at the same time you are establishing a lunar base or any other objective you want to do. Okay? You are not uh, demanding a monopoly of the space capability in the United States to pursue Mars, you have gotten it down to a scale where it can be pursued in conjunction with multitude, multitude of other goals at the same time. Okay? Now, you're, you're on the ground here. Now, you're going to stay on the ground for a year and a half until the planets line up correctly for a minimum energy traverse back to Earth. You have immense mobility while you're on the ground because of the 107 tons of methane oxygen that you produced, 
Only 96 are actually needed for the Earth return vehicle. The other 11 tons can be used to support operation by surface vehicles. And with 11 tons of methane and oxygen to support ground vehicle operations, you have available to you a total traverse, not range, but traverse, mileage as it were, of about 11,000 miles. 11,000 miles of surface activity, quite a bit different from the 20 miles of a lunar golf course. Okay. The, uh, and that's what chemical fuels do for you. That's what indigenous fuels do for you. This is proof of something which I think this society has taken as an axiom for years, which is that the key to space is the utilization of extraterrestrial resources. You <laughs> a year and a half in this scenario because you do not have a mothership. There is nobody floating up in orbit playing my columns for two years saying, when are we going home, folks? Okay. The, everybody is on the ground. They can be protection, protected by the Mars atmosphere against solar flares. You can put sandbags on the roof of your house, protection against cosmic rays. You've got natural gravity. Okay, You can do it. And furthermore, with everyone on the ground, you maximize the use of your manpower because each man you send to Mars is precious. Each man you send to Mars is an enormous mass hit in terms of the, uh, 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 the launch cost originally, in terms of what's required to support them. So they're all on the ground where they can do the job of exploring Mars, where they can support each other. You only need one doctor for the mission instead of two, one for the mothership and one for the ground. You only need one and Mr. Fixit for the, you know, you only need one of everything. Or if you have two, you're fully redundant instead of non-redundant. Okay. Any way you slice it, it's better to keep the crew together. Okay. So, we do. Instead of having a mission which takes eight launches and you get to stay at Mars for three weeks, okay, with a small crew, we do it with two launches and you get to stay at Mars for a year and a half where you can do a substantial amount of exploration. You've got the mobility, you've got the time, you've got what it takes to do the job. Now, next slide. This shows a, a depiction of what the, the, the Mars landing site would be like. And you can see it's actually a miniature base in, in and of itself. You've got the HAV, and in our initial missions, we would just deck out the upper deck of the HAV as habitation and use the lower deck as a garage and workspace and cargo area. You've got the Earth return vehicle. The reactor is in that crater in the background. Some ground vehicles, and in this case, an experimental greenhouse for beginning the experiments on growing crops on the Martian surface. Because you've got the time and you also have the power to do it. You've got a power-rich environment. You've got the reactor and you also have mobile power with the methane ox engines and the ground cars. You can go to a remote site and you can drill because you can generate 50, 100 kilowatts with an internal combustion engine, no sweat. Okay? You really have a capable mission here. The, so when these people leave this site, they leave behind that half. They leave behind the greenhouse. They leave the reactor. They leave the fuel factory, which is in kind of the lowest deck of this earth return vehicle. You can't quite see the stage break. And the ground vehicles, of course, are left behind. So we're leaving behind a miniature base in place at a given site. Now, we've got a choice. We could go back to this site. We could build it up as a large base. Or we can open up new bases. The approach is completely modular. But um, next slide. This illustrates the, uh, uh, <laughs> the mission strategy. Uh, <laughs> Send Texas to Mars. The, uh, each of those circles that you see there has a radius of 300 miles, and their centers are separated by 500 miles. Um, and, in other words, if the vehicle has a one-way range of 600 miles, it has a sortie range from a given point of 300, okay? So, but, these, but once a second site is established, you don't have to use the full 11 tons of methane ox you produce at a given site. Let's say you use nine. You leave two there. So that when people come driving over from site number two to these revisit site number one, they can leave, live in the half, and they can refuel there and continue to explore in that area. So what you're doing is you're opening up human territory on Mars on a very large scale. Each two years, you're opening up a new area approximately the size of the state of Texas. Okay? So that's your exploration strategy, constantly opening up new territory, satisfying the science imperative, with the time and mobility we'll almost, that we have, we'll almost certainly be able to discover water and experiment and find ways to extract it from the Martian permafrost. 
which means that at that point we don't have to haul liquid hydrogen to Mars anymore. That will give us additional leverage, or we can continue to produce propellant for ground vehicles at any amount at that point, and, and so forth. We bring the liquid hydrogen in the early missions because it just cuts short all the nonsense about what if you don't find water. You say you don't need to find water. Okay? It's nice if you find it, but you don't need to find it. You can do without the beginning until we get going. Now, clearly, as I say, this approach is it, it's modular. Uh, at a certain point, you won't want to continue opening up new sites necessarily. You might want to start concentrating landing bases at a given site. In other words, if you land four, five, six halves at a given location, maybe some of them are two deck uh, complete habitations on both decks. Maybe some of them have no habitation in them and just filled to the gills with cargo. Anyway you slice it, you can, you can have a grand base with ten halves, or you can have a lot of medium-sized ones with three each, or you can, you can do it any way you like. It's totally flexible. Uh, next slide. Now here's where I'm going to briefly allude to the lunar, lunar commonality that's implicit in this scenario. Here's the entire SEI. You've got one launch vehicle that does both the Moon and Mars. We've explained how you do Mars missions with this architecture. The way you do Moon missions with this architecture is extremely simple. First you launch a HAB at Mars. Obviously you get rid of the aerobrake. brake. It doesn't do you any good at the Moon. Okay. You throw the HAB at the Moon. It, instead of the arrow brake, it has larger tanks for its hydrogen oxygen engines, that's all. Which have to be, well, delta V is larger and all that. But even so, we can handle it. We have a larger throw capability to the moon with this booster. We land the half direct on the moon with no one in it. Or two, or three. However many you want to open up a given site on the moon. But let's go with a minimal mission to start. You throw one of these things to the moon, and now you've got a house sitting on the moon. Then what you do is you take one of the methane ox earth return vehicles. Except you get rid of the lower stage. The reason why we designed, we designed that vehicle so that with the lower stage, it can send you back to Earth orbit from the Martian surface, you know, with the two stages, or if you get rid of the lower stage and just use the upper stage, you've got the thrust and you've got the delta V necessary to send you back to Earth orbit from the Mars surface, uh, from the moon surface. So this thing is flown to the moon initially fully fueled with methane ox. You can do it because the weight of the propellant in the upper stage isn't that great. And you just land it on the moon next to the half. You walk out of this, you go and live in the half, you stay on the moon for as long as you like, and then when you're done, you walk out of the half, get into the Earth vehicle, and go home. It's that simple. Um, the, and you can establish moon bases in the same modular way, big bases, little bases, scattered bases, together bases, any way you like. Methane oxygen obviously costs you a little something. It's not quite as high a performing propellant as hydrogen oxygen is. You only get about 370 seconds of specific impulse compared to maybe 450 with hydrogen oxygen. But you don't have the problem of long-term storage of a very hard cryogen on the lunar surface. And that's a tremendous advantage for these missions because we want to stay on the lunar surface a long time. And that's... <laughs> and since all the heavy cargo being delivered by rocket is going one way to the moon, when the time comes to deliver heavy cargoes off the moon, you know, for construction in space and so forth, we can use mass drivers or whatever for that. The all that has to go home from the moon by rocket is people. And those payloads are small. And so we can take the hit on using methane ox. And we've got a very simple architecture. You don't have to rendezvous with a lunar excursion vehicle. It's a problem. Lunar orbital rendezvous was great for Apollo because it lightened the mission. But it, it's a problem because lunar orbits are unstable. And if you're only staying at the moon for a short amount of time, like Apollo did, that's okay. You can have a guy in there, the, thing, the orbit doesn't change that much over two, three days a week, okay, and you run and go home. But if you're going to stay on the moon in an indefinite period, clearly you don't want anyone hanging around in orbit waiting for you to leave, okay? And you don't really want to have a ship that's without anyone in it hanging around in orbit waiting for you to leave. And if you leave it at the space station and say, we want to leave the moon now, come and get us, there's an emergency here. They say, sure, we'll launch a couple of shuttle C's and an STS and put it together and be right over. That, <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't do the job. This is much simpler. You have the means available on the moon to go home at any time. And once lunar oxygen is available, methane oxygen engines can use it. And the difference then in the payload deliverable with the manned vehicle to the moon with hydrogen oxygen or methane oxygen under those conditions is too small to matter. So it's a very simple architecture for doing the Moon or Mars with the same components. And 
I, I want to say one thing about that. Look, obviously this is appealing from the point of view that it makes the whole thing much less costly. We don't have special vehicles, LEDs, LTVs, MEVs, MTVs, rendezvousing with each other. <laughs> Going here and there and everywhere, okay? We, we don't need any on-orbit assembly, none. We don't have to augment the space station with a dual keel, okay? We just lift and throw. We don't have to do 12 impossible things. And because the hardware is common to the varied objectives of the Space Exploration Initiative, I mean, face it, look, you take this side here. We've got Mars advocates, we've got Moon advocates, we've got L5 advocates, we've got all kinds of people, but we're not going to have enough political strength to make this program happen unless we all support it. So it's got to be a balanced program that doesn't shut anybody out. And this can do it. So now, I want to talk, I talk now about how we can get SEI off the ground, because I mean, look, you look at this, I defy anybody to tell me with a straight face that this is a $400 billion program here. <laughs> it ain't. So, the reason why I wanted to show all this stuff to you was because you're the space activist and I wanted each and every one of you to know when you left this place that it is absolutely untrue that SEI is a hopeless bog of $400 billion in 40 or 50 years and all the rest, it ain't so. This really can be done, okay? And we're gonna get that message out. Now, I wanna talk now get about, what? Get it to Congress. Yeah, well, we're going to. One question. Well, I'll take a brief question, but then I wanna go on. Brief question concerning the 400 billion. What level is it? I don't know, people, I, uh, costing to me is a black art, all right? right. But people have, people have looked at this, and I've got estimates by people looking at this ranging between 20 and 100 billion dollars. Okay, that's okay. the figure I wanted. Okay, so you can pick a number, maybe it's 100, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 50, but it's not 400. Right. And by 100, that 100 is not for the first mission. That 100 is for 20 years, including maybe five, six, eight missions where you already have established a fairly substantial presence on both the Moon and Mars in this way. Okay, that's to really get the thing underway. Obviously, as T goes to infinity, cost goes to infinity. But the, uh, <laughs> but within the event horizon, you know, that you choose, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's not that large a cost. Okay, now what I want to talk about is how we can start moving this thing towards, briefly, I'll talk through the phase two base building program with regard to Mars. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about colonization. The, okay, and I'll start introducing some new technologies. Up to now, we've been very technically conservative because that's what we have to be in order to get it going. But now let's go with some things that can come along. Okay, most of you, I think, are familiar with this. This is a nuclear thermal rocket engine. It was called NERVA. 20 of these were built in this country during the 1960s and early 70s. 20 were built and tested. And while there were some problems at the beginning of the program, towards the end of the program, the things worked like a charm. Now these engines work by taking liquid hydrogen and running them through the nuclear reactor, which is just a heat source, which heats to high temperature vapor and exhausts it out a rocket nozzle. It is a flying steam kettle. <laughs> and the physical principle underlying it is totally trivial. Okay. These things were built, they were tested. Next slide. Okay. How many remember 1968? Okay. Well, while legions of Eugene McCarthy were tramping through their historic trek through the snows of New Hampshire, this was going on in Nevada. This is the test of the NRX A6. This test lasted 62 minutes, generated 50,000 pounds of thrust, for, uh, as I said, 62 minutes with a specific impulse of about 850 seconds, this level of performance for this length of time would have been, com is completely sufficient to do an entire manned Mars mission with this engine, okay? With about half the mass in LEO of doing it with chemical propulsion. The NERVA engines made it through what NASA calls technology level six, which is through ground testing. The next step in the program would have been a flight test. And they were baselined by Werner von Braun, and NASA at that time to be the engine of choice for the man Mars mission, which was supposed to follow Apollo in 1981. Okay. But the Nixon administration, 
in its infinite wisdom, decided that it had had enough of a program that had to defend it. And of course, as you know, they canceled the Saturn V and they canceled NERVA. There was no technical problem with NERVA any more than there was a technical problem with the Saturn V. It just represented an embarrassing excess of capability. <laughs> But we can redevelop NERVA. Some of the old hands are still around. Westinghouse Company has preserved all the specs on it. We have all the information. The blueprints on this one was not burned. Yay! Okay. And this can give us much greater throw to Mars. With a modification of the booster that I showed you, basically increasing the thrust on the upper stage and adding a third stage NERVA, we can throw 80 tons to Mars with a single launch instead of 40. It's a factor of two benefit. That's pretty good. We can do a single Mars direct Mars mission in one launch instead of two. Okay. But you can do other things with these things. And this is a, a little concept that I'm responsible for. Next slide. This is called a nymph. <laughs> which has pleased the public relations department of Martin Marietta. <laughs> okay. The uh, concept here, see, the NERVA program was geared towards using nuclear thermal engines for their high performance, 900 second specific impulse, twice that of chemical fuels. And that's good, that's important, that'll give you this factor of two leverage that I've mentioned. But there's another advantage to these engines, which is that fundamentally the technology is versatile. Fundamentally you can use it in principle and get some level of performance or other out of almost any volatile substance. Water, nitrogen, methane, CO2. Mars has a CO2 atmosphere. So we have a landing vehicle here, the Nymph. It comes down, it lands on Mars, maybe with the help of a chute, just enough propellant to put it down on the ground after the land parachute assisted landing. Then what you do is you run a pump. You compress CO2 out of the Martian atmosphere, and the temperatures that exist on Mars, CO2 will liquefy under about 100 pounds per square inch pressure. It is an extremely sim simple physical acquisition process. The advantage of it over producing chemical fuels is that it takes about one one hundredth as much energy to produce a given mass of fuel this way as it does to perform a chemical synthesis operation. So what you've got here is a very small amount of power required to produce an enormous amount of propellant in a very short amount of time. So it's that the NIP with a 25 kilowatt power source, which could come off of its reactor, which could come off of a dynamic isotope power source, or could come off of a solar array that is deployed by hand by the crew walking outside. Anyway, you slice it with 25 kW, this can acquire enough propellant to send it back up to orbit around Mars in 30 days. <laughs> or, what is actually more valuable, to hop from one point on Mars to virtually any other point on Mars in a single hop in 15 to 20 days of propellant acquisition. At which point you can land again and then refuel <coughs> again. So you have unlimited mobility. This vehicle gives you global mobility on Mars and therefore it multiplies the, the science capability at Mars. Astronauts can visit 10 sites instead of one within a given mission duration. Okay? And to my way of thinking, the addition of this vehicle to the mission architecture at that point enables you to go from opening up new sites to concentrating on developing a single site because you are no longer in conflict with the exploration imperative. You can build up a single site and satisfy the exploration by having scientists set forth in the NIMP and visit any number of sites they want while we develop resource utilization uh, and processing and that kind of thing at a given site where most of the landings are now concentrated. And of course, that, which given site that is will be decided on the basis of knowledge that has been generated by the fact that we've explored a large area in the previous spread out landing pattern. Next slide. Well, this is just uh, to illustrate that there are various propellants that could be used in a nuclear thermal rocket. Now, the, the, the number that counts is 2800 Kelvin. That's a realistic temperature for one of these engines. And as you can see, carbon dioxide only yields 280 seconds of specific impulse at that temperature. It's not great, but it is good enough to get you back to orbit or to hop around Mars, and that's what matters. Now, if you want higher performance, water or methane will do it, okay? But they're harder to get. To get water on Mars, you're going to have to break down permafrost or at least ice at the poles. So it's a harder process. Methane, you have to actually manufacture with chemical synthesis, though, as you can see, it's a super propellant to 600 seconds. However, as we'll discuss briefly, 
While these may be a little hard to come by on Mars, they are not that hard to come by in certain other places in the solar system. And thus, this type of propulsion system, while we would gear it towards CO2 at Mars, we could use it elsewhere in the solar system with other propellants to achieve missions, in particularly in the outer solar system. Right. Yes. Next. Here's the artist's conception of a nymph vehicle. The, uh, the top is the control deck. That's where the people are when the reactors fire. Then we have an additional deck of habitation. Then you've got the pumps, which would really be a lot smaller than that because with 25 kilowatts of pumping power, I mean, that's like a 30 horsepower pump. Okay, and uh, the, the, so they're, it's smaller than that. But then you have the big uh, main propellant tank where the CO2 is stored. And then you've got the reactor and not seen above the reactor is a dish shield. And around the reactor is a coaxial tank, uh, which is also filled with CO2. And the way this works is to see when the reactor is being fired, the people are shielded from it by the dish shield, by the enormous mass of propellant in the main tank, by the machinery, by the distance, and by a second shield which sits just under their butts on the control deck. <laughs> okay. When you land on the ground, before you leave, you fill up the coaxial tank with liquid CO2 and at least some of the main tank, and thus you're surrounding the reactor with a very thick shield of liquid CO2 so as to facilitate ground operations within the vicinity of the building. The nymph reactor is radioactive, of course, after it's been fired, but not terribly so because the burn times are very short. It's about uh, two orders of magnitude less radioactive uh, in long-term radionuclides than an RTG. Okay. So, um, it's not too bad. It's a workable thing. Uh, next slide. What about nuclear exhaust? The, okay, the, 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 the fuel particles themselves are enclosed within non-fissile material. There is a certain amount of fission products that can migrate through solid material, but those are all noble gases like xenon and krypton, and they blow away with the wind. They can't contaminate anything. And once the reactor is shut down, they are no longer emitted. So uh, it, it's a very marginal problem. What? Uh, the carbon has an extremely small um, activation cross section from neutrons. Okay. The uh, anyway. Okay. If you have a nymph and you've got an NTR, that's your third stage NTR. There, you can do a manned Mars mission in a single launch. Uh, the nymph can't quite leap back to Earth from the Martian surface, so it leaves in orbit a small methane oxygen stage, and it rendezvous with that, and that kicks it home. But really. The important thing about the NIMP is not to do a manned Mars mission in a single launch with it, but just send a couple of them to Mars and have them to use at Mars for exploration and for something else. Next slide. Oh, this is just another NIMP concept. Uh, this is a, uh, obviously a winged aircraft which takes off like a Harrier by piping hot gas to the ventral nozzles, and then when it is off the ground, it pipes hot gas to the rear nozzle and it goes scooting away. And the reason why the wings are so small for a Martian airplane is because it flies at Mach 4. <laughs> the, uh, and which you can do because you've got the power of a nuclear thermal rocket engine. And this can fly level flight at Mach 4 at low altitude or it can achieve low Mars orbit. Next slide. Uh, you might ask, um, why use a NIP for global mobility instead of indigenous chemical fuel? One answer is because the chemical fuel is 100 times more expensive from an energy point of view. But the other answer is this. Because the chemical fuel must be produced at a fixed site, a vehicle using it for exploration has to do two delta Vs, one to leave the site and land, and the other to leave that and come and land back at the base. Whereas the NIMP only has to do a one-way hop. So what it means is that the, the, the delta Vs for the chemical vehicle double, and very quickly, uh, the mass ratio of the vehicle, as the hop range increases, becomes larger than that which is really achievable from an engineering point of view. Whereas the NIMP can easily attain Mars orbit and then come in and land anywhere so it has complete global mobility. A chemical hopper would only have a realistic range of about 1,000 or 1,300 kilometers or so, uh, whereas the NIMP has total mobility. Next. But it can do something else. It can transport cargo, and this is very important when you start talking about building bases on Mars. You can, okay, it can achieve Mars orbit if it's not carrying a lot, but how much can it achieve in point-to-point -point transportation, which is a smaller delta V, if you start loading cargo on it? Well, if it's got 40 tons of cargo, it can travel 4,000 kilometers, which is roughly the distance from the pole to the equator on Mars, which means you go to the Martian pole, stock up on water easily acquired, and bring it back to your base near the equator, no sweat. 
and you don't need any infrastructure at either end of the flight path. You can even take 100 tons, 1,000 kilometers. You can drop the cargoes off here and there. You have mobility. You've got transport capability on the surface. Next slide. Oh, well, this is just a uh, point that up. That's a rocket. You know, it should go up. Especially since it's one of ours. That's a Titan IV. Uh, and uh, this is to illustrate an early possible use of the NIMP. This is a, that's a Titan IV with a Centaur. And up above it is a miniature unmanned NIMP, which can be used for a Mars rover sample return mission. Except that it's, instead of visiting one site like Mars rover sample return does, it can visit 10 or 20. So it has a vastly larger science return. And here your shielding problems go away completely because it's unmanned. And in this case, the way it returns the samples to Earth, next slide, is with those two uh, little uh, space torpedoes there. Those are um, uh, Star 24 solid rocket engines and Discover type capsules. And basically, you collect samples, you load them into one of those capsules, and then the nymph descends to low Mars orbit and shoots one of those back to Earth with the nymph staying in Mars orbit. Then the capsules get to Earth, they uh, land like Apollo capsules, the Russian trawlers pick them up. They... <laughs> the Russian scientists examine our samples and they tell us, look, sites three and eight were really the ones you want to look at. And we say, right. And uh, we send the NIMP back down, it collects a comprehensive set of samples from the two or three most interesting sites. Then it goes back up to orbit and at the next launch opportunity it sends the second capsule back to Earth and we get those. Because um, okay, we caught on. Uh, but anyway, this illustrates the mission. Uh, one type of four, visit at least ten sites, two sample shipments allowing feedback in the loop, and re returning to Earth 220 kilograms of sample. That's 45 times as much by weight as the Carter Mars rover sample return mission postulates, and doing it from a multitude of sites and proving out the NIMP technology in an unmanned mode as a technology demonstration. Next. All right, I mentioned that we can do this to other places in the solar system. There are ice on the asteroids, water ice on Ceres and on the Trojan asteroids, uh, and on Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, uh, and maybe even on Io, uh, and on the moons of Saturn. And of course, we've got methane on Titan. Uh, and to me, Titan's a very interesting place. After Mars, it's the most interesting place in the solar system. Uh, next slide. So here's a Titan Explorer mission. This thing is launched to LEO on a Titan IV or even a space shuttle. It's got a Nerva-type engine, hydrogen in the tank. That propels it out on trans-Saturn injection. It gets to Titan. It spreads open those fold-out wings. Well, it aero captures first to lose its velocity, and then it spreads out its fold-out wings. And you see, Titan has got one-seventh Earth's gravity, but four times our atmospheric density. Okay? This thing uh, could travel at 100. This weighs eight tons dry. It could travel at 100 miles an hour airspeed in Titan's atmosphere and remain airborne with wings of four square meters. <laughs> with this, I mean, on Titan, you could strap wings on your arms and fly like a bird. Okay, you know, just like in the Robert Heinlein story. Uh, you could do it, no question about it. Uh, and this vehicle with wings, as you see them sized here, can pot along at 25 miles an hour in Titan's atmosphere and remain airborne. Next slide. So here's the mission. You see, this is an air breather. It just intakes air as it flies, heats it in the reactor, and uses that to generate jet thrust. It does a low-level aerial reconnaissance of Titan. We can't image Titan's surface from space because it's all clouded over. So we do a low-level aerial recon. We never land because Titan's got lots of organic chemicals on its surface. It may be sticky. So what we do is we collect samples with little small, this is an unmanned mission, but even smaller drones. These are like little battery-powered tilt-rotor seaplanes. And they can land on either the land or the methane ocean and collect samples and then fly back up to the nymph with them and have their batteries recharged there and then set forth again. And you have maybe 20 of those little things on board. So if you lose a few, that, that's the brakes. But anyway, you do a total reconnaissance of the world you collect samples and, and pictures from all over, and then when you're done, you gas up with methane from Titan's atmosphere, and you could either go straight back to Earth, or you could go and visit almost any of the other moons of Saturn except for Mimas, land there, collect a sample there, go back to Titan and refuel and do the other moons in succession. So you could do a grand tour sample collection mission from almost the entire Saturn satellite system and then go back to Earth.
and, and Titan is ultimately a home for people. You've got methane, you've got the, the atmosphere is actually 90% nitrogen, which is the only other planet in the solar system that has a nitrogen atmosphere. Uh, you've got water ice on the surface, you've got what you need, you go to Titan with a reactor, you convert heat there to electricity at 80% efficiency because of the low temperature heat sink. Uh, Titan is a target for colonization following Mars, but more on that and on. Now, okay, um, if we were to talk now, we talked about going to Mars, talked about exploring Mars, but you said if you're really going to do a colonization effort on Mars, somehow it has to pay for itself. Okay? People can imagine ways that lunar bases, for example, can pay for themselves. We all know those. But how could a Mars colony pay for itself? Clearly, exploration we can afford just to spend and do it because it's a good thing to do. Uh, but if you're going to send thousands and millions of people to Mars, even though you're not going there to make money, people don't do things to make money. People make money to do things. Okay? The, uh... But nevertheless, they have to make money in order to do them. Okay? Now, what I showed you in terms of system architectures shows the path to possibly a way to commercially support the colonization of Mars. The reason is this. You've all heard, those that you were around in the 60s, heard 10 million times the following sentence in newspapers. If there were diamonds lying on the surface of the moon, it would not pay to send astronauts there to scoop them up because it costs too much to go to the moon. Okay? Now, you all know that if there were diamonds lying on the surface of the moon, it would certainly pay to go there, not to scoop them up with Apollo missions, but you could set up a mass driver on the moon and shoot them home and make a great deal of money. Okay. Okay. No problem at all. And certainly many things a lot less valuable than diamonds from the moon could be sent back that way. But how do you do it from Mars? It's simple. You use the indigenous propellant. You use a nymph, an unmanned nymph, but a large one, a cargo nymph, if you will, that can lift payloads from, low, from the Mars surface to low Mars orbit. And then what you do is you shoot those payloads back to Earth with a small methane oxygen engine and an aero uh, capture module on board. So nothing nuclear is coming back to Earth. It's just a, a chemical unit with an aero brake. Okay? It only needs to be a very small engine, which even could be manufactured on Earth because it's a high-tech item. But it's just a second stage. You have a very, well, fairly low thrust, and it can shoot back. Okay? Just to give you an idea, Okay, if the NIF can lift 50 tons to, uh, which is 100,000 pounds, to low Mars orbit, about 40,000 of that uh, is payload. Now, to leave an, or an orbital situation and go on to trans-Earth injection, you want a thrust to weight of about 0.2, okay? Now, instead of about one and a half to leave from a surface, okay? Now, to the object leaving Mars orbit, it only weighs 40,000 pounds in Mars gravity. Okay, one eighth of that, one, one, one fifth of that point two thrust to weight is 8,000 pounds. You need 8,000 pounds of thrust to send back to Earth a 40,000 pound payload. A chemical engine typically has a thrust to weight of perhaps 40, which means the engine that you need to ship to Mars to move 40,000 pounds back to Earth would only weigh 200 pounds. So you could ship those things to Mars by the crate and send very large payloads back to Earth. Okay, and under those conditions, there are quite a few substances which are worth picking up on Mars and shooting back to Earth. Now, we don't know whether they're available, but Mars is a world. It, it has as much surface area as the Earth. It's had active geology for about the first billion or two years of its existence. Ore forming processes have occurred on Mars. There's every reason to believe there's all the different kinds of ore on Mars that there are on Earth, though admittedly they have not yet been found. But from the standpoint of geology, there's no reason to believe they're not there. And furthermore, since we know that at one time on the surface of the Earth, there were various valuable ores so abundant that primitive societies could pick them up, you know, Aztecs and Incas and ancient Egyptians picking up gold, you could obviously see was gold, uh, you know, and so forth. So it could be that there are mineral resources on Mars that are plentiful and obvious in ways that is no longer the case on Earth because of the fact that we've been doing things here for too long. Next. So this graph shows you approximately what the balance is for a variety of valuable materials. Now, the break-even point for your Mars operation is that horizontal line, and this is a log-log scale. If, you, um, if, if it's 10, it means they are actually selling to Earth materials whose value is 10 times as much cash as they are requiring to support the operation at Mars. And of course, there's a considerable uncertainty 
because the prices of these materials vary. And there's also an uncertainty relative to how much of the material that is shipped to Mars, what percent of it can be used to support exports. That's what U is. If U is 0.1, that means that one-tenth of the material sent to Mars is supporting the exports. The other 90% is supporting the Martians and enabling them to do what they want to do, to build houses, to, to increase their standard of living, to expand their habitations. Okay, so if U is 0.1, take a look at that second line there, you can see that if you've got materials that are roughly as valuable as silver or more, and there are many such materials, they could potentially be economically exploited at Mars. Next slide. Now, this year, this was in Ad Astra. This is the Mayflower. This thing is a Mars colonization ship, okay? This thing is geared towards sending people one way to Mars. Because colonization is a one-way trip, and colonists are people willing to go one way, okay? And, uh, you know, uh, so that's that. Now, the way this works, <laughs> as you can see, this is a derivation of our earlier Mars Direct Booster. It's got four main engines on the bottom. It's got half a million pounds of thrust upstairs on the chemical upper stage. But then it has an NTR stage, which is th that one up there. And it can then throw those two habitations onto, they each weigh 40 tons, onto one-way trajectories to Mars. Each of those things have a 33-foot diameter. Uh, there's about 1,800 square feet of floor space on those, not counting what's in the upper deck, which is a cargo attic. But after the cargo is unloaded on Mars, the kids can live there. The, uh, anyway, those things are thrown on direct trans-Mars injection. They tether off of each other, because we don't want to hang around a nuclear reactor. And they spin up. You've got artificial G on the way to Mars. And when they get to Mars, they arrow capture, and they land. Okay. And they provide initial housing for the people that go out in them and the beginnings of their families. Now, okay, there are six people can exist on each of these decks, so there's 24 people going to Mars one way with this vehicle. Now, let's say starting in the year 2010, just to pick a date, um, uh, we, the Earth, decides to send four of these to Mars per year. It would really be eight every other year because of the way the launch opportunities to Mars work. But an average of four a year. Now, that could be all four from the US, because we could afford four launches a year to colonize Mars if we want to do that. Or it could be one each from us, the Europeans, the Japanese, and what's left of the Soviet Union. <laughs> or any combination thereof. But if you did that, and then you make certain reasonable demographic assumptions about birth rates and death rates and so forth, which I don't bother you with right now, you can compute the population growth curve. Next slide. Oh, well, that shows the halves closer up. Next slide. Right. Now, this, by the way, was based on the assumption that the colon um, colonists that go out are all between the ages of 20 and 40, uh, and 50-50 uh, men and women. Okay? It should be self-evident that Chuck Yeager is wrong about not needing female astronauts if you want to colonize Mars. Incidentally, if you want to know the reason why you speak English, it's, it's um, because the British sent women to America and the French didn't. Um, <laughs> that, that's true, that's a fact. That's why when the battle came out in the 1750s, there were about 2 million English-speaking people in North America and only 50,000 French. Um, anyway. Okay, so Mars needs women. <laughs> So here's the population growth curve, and you can see we've broken it down, and let's take up a point here of uh, 40 years into the colonization effort. You've got 11,000 people on Mars, and about a third of them are native-born Martians, children between the ages of uh, 0 and 19. And you can go on out, and by the year, 100 years after the beginning, you've got 80,000 people on Mars. Next slide. And here, uh, we also had this one in Ad Astra. This shows the rate of sustainable 
colonization on Mars with really, I mean, look, this is totally conservative. We're talking about four launches a year with technology frozen at late 20th century levels forever. Okay, the, uh, okay, this is what you're looking at. You're talking about a rate of colonizing Mars completely comparable to the rate of population growth in colonial America in the 1600s. That is to say, from the point of view of transportation, there is no greater difficulty in colonizing Mars in the immediate future, in the immediate future, than there was in colonizing the, the, the North America in the, in the 1600s. It is this problem of the same level of difficulty. It can be done. It's not easy, but it can be done. It is a realistic goal for humanity in the coming century. In, in fact, I would say it's our obligation. Okay? Next slide. Here's this quote. The, uh, Okay, you know, this, this is a quote that I lifted from uh, Bradford's book. Bradford was the leader of the Pilgrims. And when the, the Pilgrims were in Holland and things, they didn't like the way things were going. They were being assimilated. They were losing their cultural identity. They, they, were, they were losing that which really, in their view, composed their soul. And someone advanced the idea, look, let's go to America. Okay, let's move our entire group to America where we can make our own world, where we can make our own civilization. And, this is what he reports. He says, this proposition, being made public and coming to the scanning of all, it raised many variable opinions amongst men and caused many fears and doubts amongst themselves. Some, from their reasons and hopes conceived, labored to stir up and encourage the rest to undertake and prosecute the same. Others, again, out of their fears, objected against it and sought to divert from it, alleging many things, and those neither unreasonable nor unprobable, as that it was a great design and subject to many unconceivable perils and dangers. It was answered that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be both enterprised and overcome with answerable courages. I think that's great. I mean, we celebrate that every year at Thanksgiving. That is what we really celebrate, okay? That the, the moxie that, that built this country, okay? That was required to build it, that's going to be required to build a civilization on Mars, in which I believe we have. We okay, went to the New World to, not to make money, folks, okay? They went there and cut their own path, and I think that that's fundamental. I, I, I'll tell you something to digress a small amount. And I recently have been reading a book by Václav Havel. He is the playwright who is now the president of Czechoslovakia. A year ago he was in prison. And he wrote in his book, he wrote this in prison. He said, look, the principle of entropy is the principle of reduction of all things to the most probable state, a common state, a uniform state. It's fundamentally the principle of death. Okay? It's the principle that the communist authorities are trying to impose as the basis for society. Okay? The principle of life is the principle of diversity, the principle of evolving to ever more unprobable states, to ever more diverse. Okay? It's a negatropic principle. And that's what life seeks, and that's what's fundamental for life. And while it may seem that this principle of uniformity is so much more powerful than the small elements here and there, that, that are struggling for diversity, that are struggling to establish their own identity, it's untrue. Because there is there what is alive. And, and you know, just as a, a piece of grass can break through the, the, the pavement, because it, it's big, it's, but it's passive, it's nothing, it's dead. That's what's alive, and that's what's real, and that's what's going to happen. Okay? Now, if you look at human society, see, why do we have to go to Mars? I mean, wh here I've shown you how we can go to Mars, how a Mars civilization can support itself, how it can attain sizable dimensions within a reasonable period of time, and I haven't even mentioned terraforming, which is also a possibility for Mars, the, um, as Mars was once a warm, wet planet, and can be so again, the, where plants can grow in the open and the slopes of Olympus Mons can be covered with Colorado pine. <laughs> it's not so far off as you might think. The, uh, okay, it's this. It's that living systems, in order to remain diverse, must constantly break out of their existing habitats and find new ones. And in fact, they must always go to the new habitats precisely because they are difficult to go to. 
They must always colonize a new habitat which they can just marginally make it to. Because they develop transportation technologies that vastly supersede that which we now have. Fusion propulsion, reduce the trip time to Titan to six months instead of uh, four years, or four months, whatever. Okay? And when you do that, though, okay, then you say you're opening up Titan to a flood of, of, of uh, impossible tourists. Okay, the, uh, you know, snapping pictures and, 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 and doing other things. The, uh, okay, but you've done something else, however. you created the transportation technology for the next step. And a fusion rocket that gives you routine access to Titan gives you a marginal capability for an interstellar mission in 20 to 40 year kinds of time frames. Okay, and there'll be people that will have the stomach for that. And that, in turn, will create the driver for a still next level of, of transportation technology, which I can't even postulate at the moment, but which I am certain will follow, okay, by exactly the same logic that it has always followed. That Columbus made the voyage across the Atlantic in, in, in ships that were so barely capable of it, no one in their right mind would attempt it. He did it. But as soon as they found there was something worth going to across that ocean, the art of naval architecture advanced until it became routine. And so it goes. The, so, I want to conclude with a quote that goes back a little bit further in time than William Bradford. Okay? When I was a boy, I used to read a lot of classical history. And there was one favorite speech of mine that Pericles, Athenian statesman, gave. At the end, he gave to the Athenian war dead at the end of the second year of the Peloponnesian War, at Athens' desperate war with the Spartans, the militaristic Spartans and their Peloponnesian allies. And he said, look, Okay, these men died, and some of you are their relatives and you're sad, but what did they die for? What did they fight for? Okay, they fought for Athens, and what's Athens all about? Athens here is a city, it is unique. It is a city that has fostered the, 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 the human quality, the diversity of human beings, the development of their intellects, the flowering of their intellects. A city which has created philosophers and, and who have uh, established a, a proposition that the human mind is capable of understanding the laws of the universe. A radical, incredible proposition, which is the basis of all science ever since. Okay? And, and, you know, and this is what has amazed the world. And he says, future ages will wonder at us, even as the present age wonders at us now. Now, Athens lost the war. Spartans won. But he was right anyway, because it's 2,000 years and people still wonder at Athens. And what I'm saying is that we're, if we do our job right, if we get this SEI going, if we open up the moon, if we colonize Mars, if we go to Titan, and the steps to do, this is the decisive year right now, and the, maybe the one or two years that follow to get this thing going. If we do this, then 2,000 years from now, human civilizations that will exist on hundreds of Earth-like planets scattered within the, this neighborhood of the galaxy will look back on this time, and they will wonder at us. Thanks. Very technically conservative. 
It won't work with NASA unless it is technically conservative. Okay? It's got to work. Those guys have got to do the mission. I don't care what anybody says. They've got problems, sure. But there's a lot of details involved in space missions, and I really don't think that uh, various national labs and so forth, while they can contribute important ideas, can really run a space exploration initiative. I really think NASA's got to do it. So what we're trying to do is basically we're, we've gone to NASA with this Mars Direct Architecture, and we've been talking with them about it. And uh, those that we presented it to have uh, thought very highly of it, as a matter of fact. Uh, there are other people, too. There are people with other agendas. Uh, I'm hoping, you know, NASA is saying that they intend to narrow down the list of alternate architectures for detailed study to two or three by the end of the year. I'm hoping and I'm campaigning, as it were, uh, in talking with NASA people to make sure this is one of the two, that they don't simply take minor variations off the 90-day report architecture, because I view that as a quagmire. There's too many problems with it. It's too, there, there's too many mutually dependent items. There's too much, there was too much thinking involved in that in trying to make the Moon and Mars depend upon on-orbit assembly of the space station. I'm not against the space station. I'm against making systems dependent on space station that don't have to be. In engineering, you try to decouple dependencies because if you have everything mutually dependent, it's like having an army where if one man gets shot, everybody dies. Yeah. So we make them decouple and strengthen all of them, including station, by making it more technically credible to be both a zero gravity research facility, okay, and not try to have it do all sorts of things that it's not really designed to do. And at the same time, free these other elements from dependence upon it. The, uh, okay. Now I think that if they, if they go for this, and I think there are, there are plenty of good people in NASA, and I think, uh, that if they make the fight for this, and if they make this as one of the clear alternatives, and they'll modify these designs. These are not drop-dead designs that simply must be this way. But there are certain main features of the overall architecture, the overall thought plan, which you can then iterate off of, okay? If they take that and then modify it in according to, to you know, their own insights, but if they take that as their point of departure, I think they can come up with an SEI architecture which is sellable on Capitol Hill because it won't be $400 billion and you won't have to wait 30 years to achieve the major objectives of the mission. It can be realistic in cost and in schedule. And if they can do that, I, I, I think they'll, they'll have picked up a winner. If they don't do that, I, I, it's pretty tough because uh, uh, I don't think it would really work to bludgeon them. Um, I, I think fundamentally it, it wouldn't work to get to one of these things where they're always fighting with the Air Force over, who, you know, shuttle CALS, you know, drop dead. And, uh, okay. Uh, but I really think that what's essential as far as the people here, in your discussion with people, is that you do not stand for the statement that will be made. And because we're going to get this out, okay? I'd like to get it out in Ad Astra talk to Aerospace America, other publications, and eventually if it gets published there, we can probably get into the regular papers too. But the understanding must get out that SEI is not, doesn't have to be $400 billion, and we don't have to invoke any incredible technologies or magic or anything. We, we can stay within the realm of things that are doable today with just a certain amount of hardware development. The, uh, we can do it, we can do it within a reasonable time. It can be 99 or, you know, if the bureaucracy slows things down too much, it might go to 2003. But technically, there aren't any tall poles. It's a near-term proposition, and it's just a question of, of getting going. And I think if people go out with that understanding, and, you know, when you do encounter the press, or you do encounter people that you're arguing with, you let them know that you're wrong, it ain't $400 billion. And it can even, you know, pay for itself after a reasonable amount of time with resource exploitation. But even when it's still all overhead, it's still not beyond the technical means of the U.S. alone or in concert with other nations. I'm not a politician. I'm not going to make that decision. But we can do it. Yes. Uh, we're cautious. I've seen how uh, government operates, and it's critical that you get the ear of the president in this effort. I know you have to go to NASA and give the presentation to NASA, but you have to hit the president as well, and not through NASA. Well, no, I, I want to I take this. I'll take you next, Ed.
Uh, there are several corporations in Washington which are lobbying for SEI currently. You know, McDonnell Douglas, Rockwell, and Lockheed come to mind. But Martin Marietta isn't one of them. I was wondering what you could do about that. <laughs> I, uh, that surprises me, but I could ask people about why that's the case. Uh, but I think we decided, frankly, when we saw the 90-day report, it was our evaluation of it is that it wouldn't sell. Because we looked at it, and we came in advance with the same conclusion that the Space Council came with it, that it wasn't a practical architecture, and that we had to generate our own path. We set up a group to generate our own scenario for Mars, and here was the ground rule. Design the best mission. Don't try to design a mission doing it in the way that these guys at Marshall or these guys at Johnson or these guys at somewhere else like. Don't try to appeal to some existing institutional prejudice anywhere. Just design the mission in the best possible way and let the chips fall where they may. Okay? The That is the best way we could help NASA, by simply trying to find the answers without you know, endless numbers of managers and marketeers to, to steering the study in, in some way that really wasn't appropriate. And I think what we have, that we've succeeded. I think we've come up with something that is fundamentally workable. And uh, I really hope and believe that it is possible that NASA can pick up on this. And if they do, we're going to have a much stronger hand. Uh, Ed, I said I... I Dig in, and then uh, we need to close out the session. Robert's got more time. I'm sure he can stick around a little bit afterwards. The answer, to ask the questions and answer them after we close out the session. It's Kirkland Austin Space Frontier. Can we get this as a slideshow to accompany the tape that we can buy at the uh, from the commercial tape people, and also as a video with the uh, graphics and professionally edited into the tape of this presentation? Well, uh, it's not available yet. Of course, there is the tape that these gentlemen have been making as I've been talking. Uh, the, uh, and we don't have this yet as a slideshow. As I said, this literally is the first truly public presentation of this material. Um, the, eventually, I think we could probably have it. And I tell you what, uh, what I'll do is uh, when we do have it, I will let the Space Society know about it, and then you'll be able to uh, order it through the NSS. Let's hit it and hit it hard. Yeah. Robert, thank you very much, and you saw very clearly uh, what the group uh, felt uh, with your presentation. Uh, I can't add anything to it. Wouldn't try to. Let's uh, close with a couple of things. Pat Montour has uh, a couple of uh, short actions, uh, which in fact are uh, going to benefit uh, several people. I hope everybody is in the room. If not, they'll still get the benefits anyway. And then we're going to, uh, to finish the, uh, the closing ceremony. At the uh, banquet last night, I told anybody that I forgot to thank to come up and hurt me, and they did. <laughs> I would especially like to apologize for not recognizing the said students, especially Erwin Horowitz and Sonny Arcillo, for putting together our tours. was Carol Kingsbury. She's been very helpful processing phone calls through to me that have come into the office. So I'd like to thank her. <laughs> Many of you saw the uh, Walt Disney's television's presentation of their show Plymouth. They seem to be having a problem getting this wonderful show on the air. And we were talking with the public relations people, I think is what their title was, and we came to the idea that if maybe we passed around a petition and sent it in, it might help nudge them a little. So, Karen Savage, 
I'm Pat Jackson. I'm um, press with you, you know, PR and so on. Um, I'm in the society. And that would not work. It would never work. I'm very involved. They, they've asked us to do it. If yeah, you want to no. sign it, you can. If you don't, we're going to send it in. No, I'm mean, saying is what they, what they say works. And from another campaign, Star Trek campaign, Disney campaign, other campaigns, but works with individual letters, not a petition. Speaking of letters, if I may, at the back of the room on the other side of the, this wall, we've got a Mac portable that you can type out a letter. We've got boilerplate letterhead already available to write to Disney, ABC, as well as Traxler, uh, Traxler and Milkusky. We'll, we also have an address list with all those addresses on it for you to take home with you if we can get someone to uh, donate their time and money to get some copies made of this address list for people to grab on the way out. Okay, now that all those announcements are over with. Uh, first, we're going to draw for the HP calculator that was being raffled off in uh, registration. I hope you all got a chance to buy your ticket because we didn't bring any with us for you to purchase. Um, Charlie, you want to come over and do the drawing? This person does not have to be here, so... Eric Larson. Is he here? Okay, well... We'll keep it. He's closing. <laughs> we'll send it to him. So keep that Now this next drawing is the NSS merchandising people were collecting business cards as people went by the booth. These people have to be present because we're not equipped to send this stuff. So how many do we get to draw? The lovely Karen Savage will turn the tiles for us. Actually, she's just going to pull out stuff. What's first, Karen? Show it to everybody. There's a Skylab poster. With a piece of Skylab. And the winner is Al Johnson, Grand Prairie, Texas. Are you here? You gotta be here. We'll keep pulling. <laughs> Tom Donahue. Yeah, McDonough. Tom McDonough said he's working here at uh, Plant Perry. Yeah. Didn't anybody come back to see us? <laughs> this could take a while. <laughs> Kristen O'Neill stuff. Yeah. What do we have next? Miscellaneous poster. Surprise! Surprise! Oh, 
Martin and the surprise winner might be Wayne White Jr. Wayne, are you here? No. There he is. A book called Happy the Stars by Donald L. Davey. And it's signed. 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 Father of And the winner might be David Mayer, SDS Corp. No. Not today. Are we yet? It might be Matt Kaplan. Did you leave, Matt? Matt's not here. Oh, well. Well, obviously, we have some samples. Or, Ned Chapin. Nope. <laughs> or it might be Charlie Devine. Just here, come on. He's all <laughs> It might be Dave Stevenson. Also, I'd like to remind you that there were t shirts available. I think you can still mail them by order. I don't. Are they still around? John's still around. Yeah. John's still around. Find him and buy one. Also, I want to remind you that these proceedings have been recorded by Infometics, and I believe they've still got their little window open out there. Feel free to stop by and order a set or two or three or one. Now, the next item is kind of something we're going to have to face because we really don't know what we're doing here. Something new, right? Uh, if Bob Blackledge would please come up from San Antonio's conference. We're going to do a passing of the flags. Can I have a couple of CAP cadets up here to help us? neither one of us have ever seen, and it's a passing of two flags, the Alaskan flag and the Australian flag, and I thought it'd be nice if everybody could see what they look like instead of just passing a hunk of cloth. So if you guys could just sort of, this, I believe this is the Australian flag. You won't. I mean, especially if you walk and say, look, this guy gave great talk I haven't heard in my life, you know, why can <laughs> And then we have <laughs> the Alaskan flag. I don't know if these guys are tall enough for this one. It's a big one. And then we symbolically pass these on to San Antonio. Here. <laughs> And this is the Alaskan flag. It's a thought that counts. Anyway, maybe someday somebody will write down the ceremony and we can figure it out. This is not the color guard. They're not in practice. So. But I thank them very much, and I'd like to have another big round of applause for our students. I believe, I believe that concludes everything I need to say. I pass these on. I wish San Antonio good luck, and I thank you all very much for all the wonderful things you said over the last couple of days about how you've enjoyed the conference. I thank you very much for attending.
flags on behalf of the San Antonio Conference for 91, and I invite you all to register and to come to San Antonio next year. Thank you. And now the last uh, official act of the, uh, the conference, 1990, here in Anaheim, we want to receive the uh, flag. Color guard, please. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I understand. Oh, yeah, all I want is that I'm not subject to a serious evaluation of lots of analysts and lots of Ladies and gentlemen, members of the National Space Society, and those who are not but will be soon, I'm sure, uh, on to San Antonio, and very shortly after that, at Astro.